And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. The Lord is King, Part 2, Making War, Make War, which we uh, heard in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. So if you want to turn to Genesis 18, 12, let's look at some lords in the Old Testament, and let's look at some kings in the Old Testament, and let's look at, uh, did they make war? Right. So turn to Genesis chapter 18, verse 12. I'm a King James Bible believer. Make sure you have your King James Bibles out and follow along. I've had brothers correct me because of my vision reading. I've mixed work the numbers up and whatnot. So uh, thank you for following along. Thank you, thank you. Uh, keeping me accountable. This is a long study, so we're going to try to get through it as quick as possible. Pause the video if you want. Turn there, then unpause and follow along, and then pause every time we turn to a new scripture. But we're going to go to Genesis chapter 18, verse 12. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also. Lowercase l, Lord. We're going to be talking about Abraham. Turn to Genesis 14, 5. Go back to Genesis 14, 5. But Abraham was called Lord. Lowercase l, Lord. He's a Lord. Now, did Abraham ever make war? Turn to Genesis chapter 14, verse 5. And in the fourteenth year came... I'm going to butcher a lot of these words. me uh, And the kings that were with him, and smote the Riphium and Ashtaroth, Canaan, and the Zuzims, and Ham, and the Emons, and Shehav, Carathium, and the Horites in the, their Mount Seir unto Elperim, which is by the wilderness. And they returned and came to Imuthpeth, I'm really butchering it, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazaron Tamar. And there went out the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adama, Adma, and the king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, the same as Zoar. And they joined battle with them in the vale of Sidon, with, I'm going to say Cheder Laomer, Cheder Laomer, say it like that, the king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Erak, king of Eleazar, four kings with five. Okay. And the vale of Sidon was full of slime pits, and the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountains. Okay. They were being attacked. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods, and departed. What does Abraham do? And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, and brother of Amir. And these were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his house, his own house, 318 a lot of people and pursued them unto Dan. Did Abraham make war? Oh yeah. 
he grabbed 318 of his servants, trained servants, so he had more, but trained servants, and went after Lot. And you can read the whole story. He went and got Lot back. Okay? But I wanted to show this. This shows an example of a Lord, lowercase l Lord, making war. Okay? What about a capital L Lord? Turn to Exodus chapter 15, verse 3. We're going to read some verses showing that Jesus, the Lord, because the whole point of this series of studies is the Lord is King. Do you treat Him that way? Okay? First, we need to understand that He is a man of war, and that you need to understand that there's a war going on. There was a war going on back in the past. There's a war going on today. There's a war going on, going to happen in the future. But let's talk about the man. The Lord is the man of war, and he makes war. Exodus 15:3, the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Remember, we read in 1 Corinthians 8:6, there's but one God, capital G God, the Father, and one capital L Lord, Jesus Christ. Okay, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. I believe he's talking about the Godhead. The Lord is still Jesus Christ because he is the embodiment of the Godhead, body, soul, and spirit. Okay? It says there he's a man of war. Turn to Exodus chapter 17, flip over a couple chapters, verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek, Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. For he said, Because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. The Lord will have war with Amalek. Okay? Jesus is a man of war. Turn to Numbers chapter 21, verse 13. From thence they removed and pitched on the other side of Arnon, which is in the wilderness that cometh out of the coast of the Amorites. For Arnon is the border of Moab, between Moab and the Amorites. Wherefore it is said in the book of the wars of the Lord, what he did in the Red Sea. Remember that one, the Red Sea. And the book of Arnon. And at the stream of the brooks that goeth down to the dwelling of Ar, and lieth upon the border of Moab. Okay. The Red Sea. He opened it up. We'll read it later, so I don't want to get ahead of myself. So we'll read what happened at the Red Sea. But remember there, there's a book of wars of the wars that God did. He warred, he destroyed. God, this is the Old Testament, God is the God of war. We'll get to the New Testament and we'll get to the present. I mean the future and the present. Isaiah 42.13 I'm going to turn there. Isaiah 42.13 What do we read here? The Lord shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. Future prophecy. Now, we're reading about how the Lord is a man of war. We saw how Abram, lowercase l Lord, a Lord, makes war. He protects what's his. Okay. He makes things right. What Abraham did. Right. Now, what about kings? The Lord is king. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 18. Go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 18. So we got Lord makes war. Lord Cal Sale, El Lord, capital L Lord. What is Jesus called? Lord of Lords, King of Kings. He's going to make the war of all wars. Bottom line. He's going to wage it, and he's going to fight it himself, and he's going to win. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 18. And ye shall cry out in that day because of your king which ye have chosen you, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us. We already talked about this part. 
in the first part of the series and go out before us and fight our battles. Okay? You say, well, what does that have to do with the Lord, capital L Lord? What does that have to do with Jesus Christ? Well, why don't you back up to verse 7. 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should reign over them. God fought their wars for them. Turn to Exodus chapter 14, 27. Let's look at one of the wars that God fought for the Jewish people at the Red Sea. Exodus chapter 14, verse 27. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Just wiped them out. Kind of like I'm getting ahead of myself again, but kind of like in the future, he opens his mouth, wipes them out. Here, stick gets drawn, water comes back in, wipes the whole army out. The Lord did it himself. Okay. Now, 1 Samuel chapter 14, you don't have to turn here, but 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 52. And there was a sore war against the Philistines, Philistines all the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he took him unto him. The reason I want to quote that is they chose they wanted man as a king, so Saul was king, and he went out and warred. A king makes war. He went out and made war. First uh, Samuel chapter 17, verse 33. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he, talking about Goliath, a man of war from his youth. The first battle that David was in was against Goliath. And when he became king, he was still out there fighting, making war, cleaning everything out. You can read the Bible. Um, Solomon talked about King Dave, how he could not build the temple because he was fighting the wars, God's wars, because God makes wars, and he wasn't able to build the temples. He was a king. What does a king do? He makes war. He protects what is his and takes what is his. Let that one sink in. Jesus is going to come back. He's going to take what is his. Amen. So, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Turn to Matthew 2, chapter 2, verse 1. That's Old Testament. We explained how a lowercase king makes war, and we talked about how a capital K king makes war. A lowercase L lord makes war. A capital L lord makes war. But if you look at the lowercase L lords, the capital L lord, Jesus Christ, is the one over all of it. Making the wars, allowing the wars to happen, oftentimes causing the wars. We'll get to that part. Okay. But Matthew chapter 2, one, verse 1. We're going to talk about Jesus when he's born. He was a king back in the Old Testament. Is he a king today? Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the day of Herod the king, lowercase k king, Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born, capital K, king of the Jews? Not lower lace K, king like Saul was and King David was. Capital K, king of the Jews. For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. And when they were come unto the house, they saw the young child would marry his mother, and fell down and worshipped him, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Right. There's a king. A king is born. I'm not going to go back into the, you want to see my Christ, Christmas studies where Christmas is, is, is pagan. Uh, remember, he wasn't getting gifts because in worship because it was his birthday. It was because he's a king, a capital king. Turn to Matthew chapter 10, 34, and what did Jesus do when he was king of the Jews? 10, 34, think not that I've come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. 
Amen. We'll read the whole thing, but we're going to reread this verse several times. Uh, for, I've come not, for I've come to set a man at variance against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. We're going to break that down when we talk about some things here in a little bit. But right there, think not that I've come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. What's the opposite of peace? War. Oh yeah. Jesus came to make war. I'm here to tell the truth, preach the truth. And that's what he did. And who, who did he war with the most? <laughs> Let's just throw that out there. It's not in my notes, but who did he war with the most? Uh, organized religion, Sadducees, scribes, uh, Pharisees. That's who he warred with the most. Now, let's talk about in the future. We're just touching on this stuff just to show that there is a war going on. Do you understand? We're going to talk about the war today, but first we talk about the war then. The Old Testament, we talked about how Jesus is king when he was born in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was king and he made war. We're just briefly going over that. Now we're going to talk about war in the future. People making war with Jesus Christ in the future. Turn to Revelation chapter 17, verse 7. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwelt on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life, from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. This is in the time of Jacob's trouble. And the beast that was, and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For the Lord of Lord and King of Kings, and the, for He is Lord of Lords King and King of Kings, and they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. Okay. I chose this verse, we could have talked about the verse where the sword comes out and he wipes out the 200 million man army, but I chose this verse to show that they came out to make war with Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming down, they came to war with Jesus Christ. We're sitting there watching, yeah I want to fight for Jesus Christ, but Jesus, they're coming to fight him. They're after him to kill him a second time. It ain't going to happen. He opens his mouth, you can read those verses, and he just wipes out the 200 million man army. He makes war in the end of time of Jacob's trouble. Okay. Now, let's talk about what's the war today. Okay. The war in the Old Testament, kings, lords made war. Uh, when Jesus was here, he was king and he is lord. For, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. And he made war. Uh, what's the war today for us as a Christian? Let's start with the first war that we have today. We're warring against the flesh. Luke chapter 9 verse 23. Luke chapter 9 verse 23. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. I put down here, anyone that justifies sin is not taking up his cross and following Jesus. 
right? Therefore, they're not worthy of me. Remember, we read in Matthew chapter 10, verse 38, and he, he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. When Jesus was talking about, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Then he was warring against the Sadducees, scribes, and Pharisees. Today, we'll get to the second part where we're warring against Satan in the world, but we're warring against the flesh. Are you taking up your cross, denying yourself? Okay, you come across people that justify sin. They're not taking up their cross. They're not denying themselves and taking up their cross. They're not worthy of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 7, verse 25. Go ahead and turn there. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. When you get saved, you go from being carnally minded and walking after this flesh, this body of flesh, a wretched man that I am, to going to being spiritually minded and walking after the Spirit. When you get saved, the war with the flesh starts. You will be warring with your flesh until the day you die. Jesus comes and gets us. Either one. Whichever comes first. I could be here for it. I could die tomorrow. Who knows? God knows. I always say that all the time when I walk around the house. Who knows? Well, God knows. Right. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. The war with the flesh. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Notice it says, suffer you to be tempted above you are able. We were get into that. Why does God allow us to be tempted? It's a very interesting find that, that God showed me here. Why are we being tempted? By Satan? By the lost world? By our flesh? Why are we being tempted? Right, we'll get to that. But right there, we're talking about it. we get tempted, we are fighting the flesh. There's a war going on. Are you fighting the war? Do you understand that there's a war going on? I have so many people that just, oh, yeah, I, yeah, you know, I, I, I love my sin, though. There's no war. Yeah, there's supposed to be a war. There is a war because I gave up something that I really didn't care about, but something that I really want to hold on to, sin, I ain't giving up. And they clash on to it. Where's the war? Right. Part two, the world. Satan. You're going to be warring with the world and Satan. And one of the number one weapons he uses against you, which we just read there, is the flesh. A wretched man that I am. There's none righteous, no, not one. I understand that. We are all sinners. But you're to strive for sanctification. Right. This is just us talking about wars and understanding that there's a war going on. We're going to get into how to fight the war. We're going to get into talking about being a soldier because a king that goes out and makes war, and this gets into the whole next study, has soldiers. Okay. Sanctify them through thy truth. <laughs> that word is truth. But there's a war going on. Do you know that there's a war going on, and are you fighting the war? Do you acknowledge that Jesus is making that war? Part 2, the world. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's the war that's going on today. Jesus is making it. Do you, are you fighting the war? Someone comes along and says, hey, that King James Bible is not really God's perfect written word. Are you standing for it? Oh, you know the gospel that you're preaching? It sounds nice, but you really don't need repentance. Are you standing there and you fight in the good fight? Uh, I'm standing to the King James Bible. It says, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Repentance is part of the plan of salvation. You skip it, you didn't get saved. Oh, what about dispensational teaching? It's bad. No, dispensational teaching is what the Bible teaches. Rightly dividing the word of truth. 
Study to show thyself approved. All right. And on, the Godhead. I'm standing for the Godhead because the King James Bible teaches Godhead. Trinity, pagan, satanic, those who stand by the Trinity will go to hell. It's that simple. Are you fighting the war against this world? Coming in and saying, hey, that's not right, and getting you to turn your back on God's perfect written word. On truth. To get you to turn your back on the real Jesus Christ of Scripture. Remember what Paul warned us about in Corinthians. Uh, someone come along preaching another Jesus, getting you to receive another spirit, preaching another gospel. He warns us there's going to be people out there in the world that's going to come, and you're going to be battling with them. I'm not giving up the true gospel. I'm not giving up the real Jesus Christ. I have the Holy Spirit in me, not another spirit. Okay. First Peter chapter 5, 8. Okay, it's a warning. For instruction and righteousness, it's a warning. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. It's a warning. You're to be on your guard. There's a war going on in this world. James 4.4. 4. Go ahead and turn to James 4.4. 4. It's a good memory verse. A lot of us have it memorized. If you don't, it's a good verse to get memorized. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. To be an enemy, there's got to be a war. There's a war going on. The world is going to try everything it can to pull you away from Jesus Christ. To pull you away from His Word. To get you to sin. They will entice your flesh and get the flesh on their side. So now you're being tempted by your flesh and you're being tempted by the world. So a lot of things we've already talked about in the past. If you're new to this ministry, we talked about lots of things that help you uh, fight the flesh. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Word. Prayer. Doing good things with your hands, good addictions with your hands that glorify God. Right? Singing old hymns. I have to throw that in there. But there's a war going on today. Matthew 10.34. We're going to go through that one again real quick. If you want to turn back to Matthew 10.34. I've just got to throw it in there again. Okay? Think not that I've come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man at variance against his father. And a daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. The people closest to you are the ones that are going to be their biggest enemies. Okay? And I'm not talking about close to you like brethren. I'm talking about family members that refuse to and reject the real Jesus Christ. You make a stand. You change your life. Which is going to get us into the next one. You're going to, you prove yourself. Let that sink in, the word prove, because we're going to talk about it here in a second. And they don't like it. They don't like you living the way you do, taking the stands that you do. Saying, I'm sorry, I can't spend time with you because I don't want that in my presence. The Bible says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Sorry. Put no wicked thing before thine eyes. Don't want it in front of me. So let's get to the proving part. Why did God make war in the past, Old Testament, with his people? Why did he make war? Well, one of them was is they didn't drive everybody out to begin with. You can look that up. But when we read here, there's a second reason why G uh, Jesus, their king, didn't drive everybody out. Because this we're going to read in Judges chapter 2, 20. Joseph, um, I like reading about Joseph. Uh, not Joseph, Joshua. Joshua, who went out, the walls of Jericho, he went out and he fought and everything, and he didn't kick everybody out like they were supposed to. So God said he's going to leave some of them in. But here's another reason why he left some of them in. Judges 20, or Judges chapter 2, verse 20. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he said, Because that this people has transgressed my co covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not hearkened unto my voice, I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died. Punishment. But here's another thing. Here it is. That through them I may prove Israel. 
through them he may prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein, as their father did keep it or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, never delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. Why was the war going on? There's a little bit more to it, I understand, but for us today, so I can apply it to our instruction right, just to prove them whether they would obey the word of the Lord. It was to prove them. That's why the wars were there. Mm -hmm. Now today, why the war today? We have a war against the flesh, and we got a war against the lost world, Satan. Why is God allowed to happen? To prove us. Turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. That's why people say, you just say you're a Christian, let them on in. He comes in, wipes the whole group out, and he's like, yeah, I got him, Satan, I got him for you. Why? Because he didn't prove himself. There's three words, I'll go ahead and get ahead of myself. There's three words we're going to be talking about. Repro uh, prove, approve, and reprove. You prove yourself, you get approved by somebody. Yes, I bear witness. This man is, is a Christian. Changed life. Taken stands. Okay, the guy, I don't have this in my notes, but Paul, the, someone had to approve Paul. Say, listen, he's not the same guy as he once was. He's not killing Christians anymore. He's out there. He's been beaten. He's out there preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He got approved. Okay, he proved himself and he got approved by a fellow brother in Christ. But Romans chapter 12, verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Prove. Okay? You cannot prove that you're a Christian if you conform to this world. You cannot prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. The basic example for that is the perfect will of God is remember what the Bible says about for God's will is that none should perish but that all should come to repentance. That's God's will. If you conform to this world, you have the attitude of you don't really need repentance and therefore you motivate people not to repent when it comes to salvation. And you prove yourself to be false just like they are. All right? Prove yourselves. That's why there's a war going on right now. Prove yourselves. Why does Satan allow you to be tempted? I say, why does God, sorry, allow Satan to tempt you? Your flesh to tempt you. Why does he allow you to be tempted, period? To prove you. And there's always a door. There's always an escape. For you to overcome that, um, to overcome let's see, temptation, to overcome that temptation. Turn to Romans chapter 16, verse 10. Here we're going to read about a Christian who's being who's approved. It says, "Salute Apelius, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobulus' household." I put a period there, but there we read, he's approved. In other words, the brethren said, yeah, people you know who are saved are saying, yeah, this person's saved. He's approved. He's proven himself. Changed life. The work he's done for the Lord. That's backed by Scripture. That's important. The work you do for the Lord better line up with Scripture. Or it's not work for the Lord. But he's approved. There's a war going on. The war with his flesh and the war with this world. He's putting his life on the line to go out there and preach the gospel. To do the work of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11. For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves. Clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. And all things, all things, you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. True biblical repentance 
as it applies to the plan of salvation, leads to a changed life. You become a soldier for Jesus Christ, and you start warring against the flesh, and you start warring against this lost world. The world, the rulers in the darkness of this world. Spiritual wickedness in high places. The Bible talks about how children, you're the children of Satan. Uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. That his ministers are transformed into the ministers of righteousness. They like to put on a show and pretend to be like they're for the Jesus Christ and they're for Satan. Okay. When you truly get saved, that war starts and you're fighting a war. So you believe that Jesus Christ is your capital L, the capital L Lord, the capital K King, Lord of Lord, King of Kings, are you fighting a war? You need to ask yourself that. Is everything just fine and dandy and you're going with the flow or are you fighting a war? The word approved, we saw that there. In all things you have approved yourself and to clear this matter. Approved. Shown or proved to be worthy of approbation. Someone said, come here, look at this guy. He is a Christian. Or the guy showing himself, present tense. Hey, I have a changed life. I'm doing the work of the Lord. I'm fighting the good fight. I'm making the right stance. I'm living a life of Christ. Okay? Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. A lot of people don't make it. They do not prove themselves or are approved. And this is why. It's no repentance. Let's take repentance out of salvation. Let's take repentance out of your day-to-day -day walk with the Lord. We can't be judgmental. Yeah, we can. We're in a war. We're in the middle of a war right now. With our flesh, I want to keep saying it, and with the world. Satan, who's the lowercase g God of this world. The lost world. Oh yeah. People don't get past that point. And then you realize that a lot of the false Christians out there, the fakes and the frauds, they are fighting a war, but whose side are they on? Who are they fighting for? Something to think about. We'll get to that a little bit later. Turn to Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. This is Paul, remember? The Corinthians are so carnal that he's doubting their salvation. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. And he's not asking for a, a confession, a word, like just words to come out, what does he say next? Prove your own selves. Know ye, know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates. Prove your own selves. Prove it. Are you fighting the good fight? Are you warring with the flesh? Sanctification. Is you, are you allowing God I can't do it. Are you allowing God to clean up your life? Am I allowing God to clean up my life? And as God cleans up my life, am I warring with the flesh? With my flesh? Okay. Prove your own selves. They were so carnal that he doubted some of their salvations. I don't think you're saved. Prove yourself. Well, we don't have to prove ourselves. We can just be carnal Christians and live how and just say I believe in the big guy upstairs and we can live however we want to live. No. The Bible says they're to prove themselves. There's nothing wrong with me saying, you call yourself a Bible believing, God fearing man or woman? Prove it. Let me hear your testimony. Let me and then your testimony should be the changed life, the stands you take, how you live your life for Jesus Christ. Prove it. Reprobate, we see the word reprobate there. Reprobate, not enduring proof for trial. They're fake. Another definition of it is not of standard, not of standard purity or finesse. Disallowed, rejected. Another one of reprobate. Oh, you tried to say you're a Christian? You're not a Christian. Why? Because you, you, you just said that this isn't God's word, the King James Bible. Maybe you don't know about the Bible version issue, please look into the Bible version issue. But I'm just throwing little things out there, but everything will tie in together. When you, you don't just ask one question, do you believe this is God's word? Yes it is? Okay, you're a Christian. No. Okay, then 
Tell me about Jesus Christ. Tell me about the instruction in righteousness. Tell me about your stands on sin, the major doctrines. How do you live your life? Okay? You ask it all. Verse 2, abandon in sin, lost to virtue or grace, reprobate. Just so you know, that's what it's talking about there. Prove your own selves, know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. In other words, Jesus Christ isn't in you. There's always, always supposed to be evidence of the war that's going on. I've given my testimony before, it's been a long time of my struggles with the flesh, and I'm trying to out there doing videos, standing for God's word to encourage the brethren, words have meaning, also to encourage the brethren with prayer, living a sanctified life, living for the Lord, helping one another. That's my point, that's what I feel I'm called to in God's ministry. Okay? But it's a war going on, and it is. I get so many bad comments underneath not as some of the people that are in ministry but I still get comments under my videos being attacked personal attacks attacking my Lord Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior the Lord who is King my general my commander there's a war going on and they're trying to attack him okay. turn to Galatians chapter 6 verse 4 let's see that word again prove but let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in, in, other, in another. Best example for this one I said is people doing their own Bible studies, sanctification, preaching the gospel. They're always like, well, I'll let, see that man up there on the video and point out me, I can see myself on there. See that man up there, he can preach the gospel for me. Uh, no. You need to prove your own work. We're all called in the ministry of reconciliation. I had, I tell this story before, I came across a professing Christian woman that said, I don't feel like I'm called in that part of the ministry. Uh, she's not proving her own self. We're all called into the ministry of reconciliation. We're all called to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Okay? But I've heard this statement a lot of times. If this brother online stops making videos and his ministry gets shut down, I just don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, you're supposed to be proving your own work. Prove his own work. You need to be doing your own Bible studies, brothers and sisters in Christ. You shouldn't be relying on mine. You shouldn't be relying on any brothers out there. It's great to have ministries. I follow ministries that teach the King James Bible. There's nothing wrong with that. But you need to be doing it on your own. You need to have your own Bible studies that you're doing. Okay? Your own work that you do for the Lord. Handing out gospel tracts, laying gospel tracts places, prayer, sanctification is doing work for the Lord. That hardly gets mentioned when it comes to doing work for the Lord. It's doing work for the Lord. Right? I have grace, brothers and sisters of Christ. Those of you who struggle with sin, who are fighting sin, you're doing you're fighting that war. Okay, And if you want to win that war, remember what the Bible says. I can do all things through who? Christ was strengthened me. Through Jesus Christ. You go through Jesus Christ, and he'll help you win that war with the flesh. The war with this world. He's our rock. He's our foundation. I keep going through it again. He's our general. Okay? There's a war going on. But you need to make sure that you're doing these things yourself. I can't clean up your life for you. I can preach instruction and righteousness, but I can't clean up your life for you. You need Jesus Christ, and you got to submit yourself to the Word. You need to be reading this yourself. You need to be doing your own Bible studies. But there we see the word, prove his own work. You need to prove it. I had one guy when I was at the farmer's market tell me, oh, he couldn't read the Bible because he's kind of dyslexic and everything, and I saw him read something, but... He's like, he's dyslexic, so he doesn't really read it that much. And I, when I tried to mention, like, on CD or tape, oh, yeah, yeah, there's one of those things out there. Yeah. He needs to be reading it for himself. He just goes to a Bible building and lets somebody else do all the work for him, and he sits there. He's not fighting a war. He's not. He's not armed, which is the next study we'll get to. But you see what I'm saying? You're supposed to prove your own work. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. 
Turn to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. We're proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and we're reproving the unfruitful works of darkness. Hey, that drinking, getting drunk, alcohol over there, that's bad. We're doing that. Video games, movies, TV shows, fornication, drugs, all right, cussing, you know, smoking, you know, dressing modestly. We try to promote that which is good, light, and what happens? We have to reprove the darkness. The opposite of all those things as far as when someone's doing those things, they don't want to repent, then we got to reprove them to bring light to the world. That what they're doing over there? is wrong. They that sin rebuke before all that others may fear. Okay. Second Timothy 2.15 Another good memory verse. Second Timothy 2.15 We're losing light out here, so I'm trying to push it a little bit. Okay, we're almost at the end. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay. Approved unto God. This is how you can prove yourself and be approved. Okay? You go about to prove yourself and I see what's going on and I go, okay. Oh, it does line up with here. You're approved. Lines up with scripture. That's what being approved is. You prove yourself and you get approved. Mm -hmm. And that's why this is the foundation. I want to throw that in there again, brothers and sisters Christ. The King James Bible is the foundation, not man. Uh, not me. The Bible. Okay? You go through the Bible to approve people. Do they line up with Scripture? That's what their teaching lines up with Scripture. Is how they're living their life line up with Scripture. Are they just telling me what I want to hear? Or are they living it? Proving the most the proving themselves. Turn to Philippians chapter 1, verse 23. I want to talk about Paul real quick. For I am in a straight strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. Why am I talking about that? Paul's like, I'd rather be with Jesus Christ, but I need down I need to be down here proving myself to you, approving people, and reproving people. You can see that there's false converts in First and Second Corinthians. He's reproving people. Second okay. Timothy four, chapter four, verse two. Turn to Second Timothy chapter four, verse two. Talking about Paul. Okay, this is what he says: Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with long, long suffering and doctrine. That's why it's better for him to be here, to set the example. This is a changed life. This is the true gospel. This is the major doctrines. This is instruction righteousness. This is how you're supposed to live. I'm not just telling you to live that way. I live that way. I set the example. Okay. So Paul stayed to approve himself, approve, approve the body of Christ, and reprove those that refuse to repent. And rebuke, you know, false converts. Rebuke people that were coming in and preaching another Jesus, another gospel, and getting people to receive another spirit. Okay, wolves in sheep's clothing. First Timothy chapter five twenty. We read that already. How said it's them that sin rebuke before all. That's why Paul stayed. He's like, I have to be here for you, brethren. Them that sin rebuke before all. Okay. The word reprove means to charge with a fault to the face, to convince of a fault, 
or make it manifest. You can reprove someone by letting them know, hey, what you're doing there is wrong. There's correction and it goes as far as being reproved. I got to make it manifest. See, I need two. That's why you go with two or three witnesses. You go by yourself to correct them. You go with two or three witnesses to reprove them. Hey, we've seen this. We're trying to bring it to light. You are doing this. It's wrong. The Bible says it's wrong. Okay. If you believe that Jesus is the Lord of Lords, we're wrapping this up. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, the Lord is King, which is what I call this series, then you understand that there is a war going on. You understand the purpose of the war. It's to prove yourself. Okay. God is making the war. When you get saved, you are now on God's side, and God is the one making the war. Okay. Now here's the question. Are you a soldier of Jesus Christ? Or are you a soldier of the world? You understand that there's a war going on, and you're supposed to be fighting the war. Whose side are you on? Exodus chapter 32, 26. I'm just going to read this verse. You can read the whole story because you can read further in, but we'll talk about the story. Exodus chapter 32, verse 26. Then Moses stood at the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. Did he say, Who's on the Lord's side? Who is on the Lord's side? Continue doing what you're doing. Continue. They were, they were getting naked and dancing and worshiping this. Uh, golden calf and just all kinds of wickedness just continue what you're doing whoever's on the Lord's side continue what you're doing no who's on the Lord's side let him come unto me and then it talks about them getting their swords what's the sword for a Christian today King James Bible who's on the Lord's side you have people saying there's no repentance they're all going around preaching false gospels no who's on the Lord's side Come unto me. Stand for the true gospel, the true Godhead, dispensational teaching, eternal security, sanctification, instruction and in righteousness, abstain from all appearance of evil. Who's on the Lord's side? Come unto me. There's a war going on. Fight the war with me. Who's on the Lord's side? Or are you on the world's side? What side are you on? I'm going to leave this verse with you, brethren. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 31. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Prove all things. Not just what you feel like it, not what you think that people need to know. You're to prove all things. New creature in Christ Jesus, all things. Things have, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I'm trying to emphasize the word all, but jumping the gun and not getting there fast enough. But all things have become new. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Brothers and sisters of Christ, make sure you're proving all things. And you're holding fast to that which is good. Next study will be about soldiers. So, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.